This is the finding opportunities module. Now, when I think about finding opportunities, I think about really strength conditioning. I think we are probably the most utilitarian and most capable of really figuring out ways to be valuable from everything from working in the weight room to evolving into things like return to play, nutrition, sports science, motivational sciences, interacting with the staff, interacting with sports medicine. We are a incredible medium between a lot of different components, right? We are keeping the engine greased and moving. And what that really means is a lot of opportunity. It's a lot of moments where you can really bring value and what we're going to talk about too and down the road is that value either has more direct compensatory outcomes for you at your current employer or future opportunities at another employer at another entity, right? The amount of things that you can do after becoming incredibly diverse with your skill set and your contribution is immense. And that's the thing you should be thinking about. It's not only can I directly serve the team or organization I'm working with, but man, the opportunities after that are immense. It just opens up Pandora's box. So what we're going to go through in this module are ways to find opportunities. And then not only that, ways to capitalize on that opportunity. So let's hit this module. So Walking into work, and I got right programs. I got to coach athletes in the weight room. Maybe I got to do some speed stuff. Maybe I got to do some stuff in nutrition. Is that my job, right? That, that from a job description standpoint, that's probably what checks the box. Now, where we find a lot of times strength and conditioning really takes on roles and responsibilities that are not necessarily towards that job description. And why does that happen? Well, one, someone needs to do it, right, from a sports science perspective or sports psychology or sports nutrition, uh, interacting, communicating with administration and, and sports medicine. All these things need to get done just for whatever reason, you know, kind of falls within the domain of strength and conditioning. A lot of times we volunteer ourselves, right? We, we put the, we'll volunteer up, right? We'll be the person that will be available to do those things for the staff. A lot of times it just needs to get done. Right? If no one else is going to do it, and no one's volunteering, strength and conditioning are pretty good about, hey, yeah, I'll get that done. I don't really care about much about the fanfare or the notoriety or recognition. I'm just very, very, very competent and capable. And I think it's my moral obligation to be able to do that. But what does that get you? One, it gets you more value with the organization and institution that you're working with, right? That the more things that you are responsible of overseeing, the more value you have and the harder it will be to replace you, right? We're going back down to day one. We're going back down to now building this uh, overall setup where you can get a lot of compensatory responses, whether I can make more and justifiably make more at my current institution or create opportunities in future places, right? Imagine being in the job interview and saying, yeah, I can do sports science. I've run GPS, I've done force plate, I've done bar speed, I've done high level tracking of workloads, whether it's heart rate monitoring or subjective, subjective RPE. I can do a lot of different things. I can create dashboards and platforms through various things, various team hubs that can manage that. I'm very competent in all those directions. I can collect data, I can organize that data, and I can translate that data to coaches and sports med and admin. I can do sports nutrition. I can work with sports, sports medicine to work on a return to play or post-operative, post-rehab cycle of going back in the weight room. These are all things that just kind of organically start to occur. But what does that get you? Get you a lot of opportunities at your current place. One, you're more valuable. And two, there's definitely a bigger compensatory output off of that, right? Imagine if you had another opportunity to leave and they go, wow, we can't replace you. We'll take two or three, maybe even five people to replace you. We have to keep you. We'll do whatever it takes. Or the next place will value you that much more because how much utility you have. So what we want to go through is seeing these moments, right? They happen all the time. It's gonna happen a lot more at a place with a very meager and minuscule budget. It's gonna happen a lot more, and you, ironically, you see it with big, big resource organizations and teams that have a little turnover, right? There's a lot of grandfathering in, there's a lot of just not much change, right? Everyone just kind of does their job and goes home. So inserting yourself into new and innovative aspects of the job 
more and more opportunity there than you would imagine. It's the place that has high turnover, that's constantly looking to evolve, constantly push the boundaries and thresholds. And the first iteration of it's always bad, so it's always going to leave some sort of impression that this isn't as valuable, right? It's a good idea, just bad, poorly applied. Or it's a poorly applied concept, just not really well thought out from an organizational standpoint. Or maybe just not follow through, right? How many great, how many great ideas just get stopped before it actually gets any momentum? Someone gets fired, someone leaves, someone just doesn't really pick up the, the slack in other areas. Maybe it's neglecting their primary job. All that stuff happens, right? And where I see it as, as yes, luck is the when opportunity and preparation meet, but other times it's just being real savvy on what's being asked of you, right? And I go through in the book of, hey, what, what's going on with our guys? They look tired or they look slow or whatever it is. So a great opportunity there from either a sports nutrition, a sports science, or a practice player load management, right? Those are all opportunities to talk about how can we manage some things. And there's a good and a bad way to do it, right? Your practice plan sucks. You're wearing the guys out. We shouldn't be doing 24 periods of full pads. We're just breaking them down unnecessarily for no reason just because we always done it. Or mat drills are stupid or we shouldn't do, be doing post-practice conditioning. Uh, we don't need to do all this three days of straight full pad practice. Nobody wants to be told they're an idiot. There's a good and a bad way. You have data, you have it ready, and you go to them and say, hey, look, if we go back-to-back -back high days, meaning that we're going to go full pad practice for 24 periods, the second day is always going to be bad. And the third day is going to have enough of a residual where it's going to lead potentially into a dec decreased performance on game day, and that's why we look slow. We just have too many high days in a row. So my advice potentially might be getting a little bit more of a rest day or a day of recuperation with cutting back on periods or cutting back potentially on full pads going just shells or helmets in that day in between. Getting more of a recovery from this high intense period because that's the stuff that's going to give you some sort of traction, communicate, talk to. Is there anything we can do on a Wednesday practice going into a Saturday game with just shells or helmets that's going to get us prepared? Right, And that probably means we can't go full pads on Thursday, but maybe towards the latter half of the year, that's not a big deal. Right, we've gone through and calloused the body from a contact perspective, and we've gone through the process of, of tackling, and we're, we're as good as we're going to be at it. So now, now it's a matter of let's just go shells or helmets and try to just get them off the field faster so we can get them recovered and hopefully playing at a higher level in November, December. That's the money games. you know, And that's the part that – we're looking through all this stuff, man. You know, like I don't think many strength coaches really have that that awareness of the opportunity. Sports nutrition. If no one's doing it, do it. Talk at least talk about what they should be eating at, at training table, what they should be eating for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, what they should be trying to do from a post workout or peri workout nutrition standpoint. Have conversations about supplements. Be aware of that. They're gonna listen to you as a strength coach more than anybody else. And it's a good responsibility, a good opportunity. And when an admin comes in, of like, what do we need to do from a sports nutrition standpoint? Well, I got some ideas. Perry workout nutrition, Perry practice nutrition, those are all really good places to start. And maybe it leads into getting a nutritionist. Maybe it leads to getting some more resources. Maybe it leads to something else down the road from body compositional analysis or, or, or blood panels or dried urine samples, whatever. But the other note is, like, you can't get to that unless you start. And you got to find opportunities to do that and be ready and work through it and don't quit. That's the other side is don't stop when it gets hard. Don't stop when it's becoming really challenging from you doing the rest of your job. Just be better and be more organized. You know, for the parents out there, becoming a parent wasn't hard if you're organized. Becoming more, having more responsibility at work isn't hard if you're more organized. Just be better at strategizing and organizing your day and you'll be fine. Module tasks. Let's look at opportunities within your current athletic department or an athletic department that you're interning or volunteering at that you see as a value prop. And then ask, say, hey, do you mind if I at least start to like rough draft or jot out some ideas of how I should take that on? And then from there, say, I would like to start to slow roll this and build this out. And maybe we could build a sports science department. Maybe we could build a sports nutrition department. Maybe we can have better communication and collaboration with our sports medicine or sports psych or anyone else or our coaches. Let's start to do those things. Let's start that process. Let's start to create more value and find these opportunities for you as a strength coach within your department.